Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Near the end of the second section of Kant's groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, he discusses the freedom of the will. And in fact, one of the things that he wants to tell us at that point is that the freedom of the will, which is a, a very important doctrine uh, running through many moral theories, is not something that we can empirically verify or experience, but rather something that must be, as he says, presupposed, or sometimes it's called posited, for ausgesetzt in, in German. And why is this the case? Why, on the one hand, do we have to assume it or to have it there in whatever account we're going to have of human beings, of morality, of, of all these sorts of things? And on the other hand, we can't actually experience it and thereby uh, refer to that experience by way of proof uh, at the same time. That's a, that's a great question. So he starts out by talking about the will itself. And he says that the will as a faculty is a type of causality that belongs uniquely to living, rational beings. So Kant is not going to talk about the will as something that, say, you know, any old thing happens to have, for instance, a, a chalkboard or even a, a cockroach or, you know, an amoeba or something like that. He's, he's confining this to human beings and whatever might else be rational. Now notice that he calls it a type of causality. We're going to explore that very important notion in a moment. He says it's a causality that belongs to living rational beings and freedom is a property of that causality. So freedom is something that we can say precisely about that causality. So we've got will, which is a kind of causality. And then there is this kind of causality here, which is free causality, we might say. So it's a property of that causality, that is the will, um, that it can be efficient, that it can produce effects without other causes determining it. In earlier ways of thinking about this, for example, Aristotle talks about, you know, human beings being a self-moved mover, right? Um, with Kant, that, that notion is being rolled into this, this notion of causality. I cause my will to determine itself. The will is reflexive. It bears upon itself. It can determine itself regardless of what other outside factors are impinging on it. Kant, by the way, is not denying that we have all sorts of things, you know, suggesting to our will which way it ought to turn or what object we ought to prioritize over another. That's, that's a guaranteed, that's granted, that's part of our experience. But he's saying that the will has this property, the property of freedom, namely that it can, it can actually set all of those aside if it chooses to and say, nope, I'm going to do this instead. And so the will has what we might call a certain spontaneity, or even at this point, we might say arbitrariness to it. We can contrast this against what Kant calls physical necessity, which is when objects simply behave the way they do because they are following causes and effects and laws like, you know, for instance, gravity. I drop this, it's got to fall, right? There's no choice about it one way or the other. Now, I, of course, did have a choice about whether I drop it or use that as an, an example. And you might say, well, wait a second, Dr. Sadler. 
What about your brain states and, you know, um, all sorts of other interesting regularities that we can talk about? Maybe, you know, the laws of association in psychology, whatever it is that you want to put out there, right? We can talk about human beings being determined not just by, you know, physical interactions, but also by cultural and social interactions, which at the same time can be reduced to laws. Well, Kant would say the will is also able to determine itself abstracting or bracketing or prescinding from those causes as well. So if, you know, uh, some psychologist has worked out or some neuroscientist has worked out some law that says, Dr. Sadler must do this at this moment, I can still say, nope, not going to do that, going to do something else. It goes beyond this, however. So, and this is where um, causality and, and a very short analysis of causality comes in that's, that's quite important. So Kant says, look, causality involves laws. That's why it's intelligible to us to begin with. If we didn't have laws, if we weren't able to say that the cause in some way necessitates or produces the effect, then we wouldn't be able to make any sense of it. We wouldn't use these terms like cause and effect. We wouldn't put together a coherent world. And Kant thinks that causality is something that we can't help but you know, see out there in the world. Now the question is, what about our wills? Are those caused or are those just effects of other causes? We've already talked about this. The will has a freedom and spontaneity to it. Now the question is whether the will just does what it does sort of arbitrarily, you know, in a willkürlich in German, uh, will-like, actually arbitrary, contingent way, or whether there is a, a different kind of law that, that's working here. So uh, freedom does not depend on physical laws. As a matter of fact, it, it's able to set them aside, right? However, Kant says that does not mean that it is thereby lawless. It would actually be incoherent if it were totally without any regularity whatsoever that could be, could be uh, observed, right? Or, or understood, at least conceived of. So it does have laws. What kind of laws? Well, those can't be physical laws because then it would be dependent upon them. It can't even be like psychosocial laws or however else you want to think about it. It can't be dependent upon, say, neuroscience to use our latest thing that everybody's, uh, you know, wild about. It's going to solve all of our problems. From a Kantian perspective, no. Freedom uh, has laws, but those are not laws dependent upon those sorts of things, physical necessities however they may be parsed out and understood into the social and cultural, it gives itself laws. And what do those laws look like? Well, unsurprisingly, these are going to be the kinds of laws that you know, can fit, for example, Kant's insistence on universality. You know, for example, the categorical imperative in its first formulation, <clears throat> that we should act always on the maxim that can be willed at the same time to be a universal law of nature. Right? Those are the kinds of laws that actually do, in fact, make us free, according to Kant. He goes a little bit further in telling us that the freedom of the will must be understood not only as belonging to us, but belonging to all rational beings. And now you might say, well, how can we possibly know that? I mean, we can't even em empirically experience our own freedom of the will in ourselves. How are we supposed to do that in other people? And Kant says, look, this is not something that needs to be empirically uh, uh, noted or proven or anything along those lines, right? Instead, um, he says, uh, we have to assume it, or we have to postulate it. We have to think it. We cannot actually make moral decisions without having this in the background. And now through our analysis, we have brought you know, the free will or freedom of the will to light as something that we do in fact have to ascribe to everybody. Now notice what Kant is saying and notice what he is not saying. 
He is saying that all human beings, by virtue of being rational, are free. He is not saying that we do not have, as human beings, living in a world and in culture, all sorts of you know, messages that can act as causes upon us. However, we do not have to be, with a sense of you know, absolute necessity, uh, determined by them. There is a possibility of deciding for what is moral, and that's all that he's holding out for here. He's not saying that everybody will act in a moral way or realize what is moral or choose what is moral. It's always possible, precisely because the will is free, for it to throw away that very freedom. But according to Kant, the will is indeed free, and here is how it works.